Amen. Good evening. Good evening, sir. You know, when, when, when you come up to a place like this and, and you can't put the book, you, you, got, you put it here and a light blinds me here, put it here and the microphone's in the way, and you put it here in the shack. But we're going to sing anyway. Y'all laugh. It's okay, y'all. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Ooh, did y'all have a good day today? Some of you, yeah, yeah, good. The rest of you is just trying to make up your mind, and, and that's okay. Uh, we're so glad to be here. Last night was good. If, if you weren't here last night, um, you, you missed a blessing, and, and you're, you're going to have to work real hard tonight to catch up from last night. But, but we're, we're looking forward to what God has in store today. You know, I'm thankful that every day His joy is renewed, His yeah. grace and His mercy every yeah. day. Is, is made new, and, and we have an opportunity to love him more today than we did yesterday, and uh, we're so glad for that, and tonight we're going to begin with a song that I, I, I asked uh, Miss Susan if she had a favorite song, and, and she don't know, this is one of my favorites too, I have a lot, but this is one of my favorites, Love Lifted Me, Amen. let's stand and sing all three verses, and sing it just like you mean it, Love Lifted Me, I'm glad that I was, I was thinking one day, <laughs> but the Father reached down his hand. And pick me. Let's sing it. Bless your heart. Listen to the words that you're singing. Page 546 in your hymn book. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. I want to go back and repeat that. We're not going to sing it again. I just want you to hear the words that you just sung because I don't think you can sing the next verse without understanding this verse when he says, All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence I live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true. Listen to this. Merits, deserves my soul's best song. And so often we give him the leftover. He deserves our best song. So, so listen to the words of the, the about souls and dangers. Look above. Jesus completely, not halfway, not fourth of the way, not some of the way, but completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows, his will obey. He's your Savior who wants to be, be saved today. Let's sing this last verse just like you're saved today. Will you do it? Third verse. Souls in dangers look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. And he's the master of the sea. Hills his will obey. And he, your Savior, wants to be. Love 
Somebody say amen. amen. You can be seated in the house of the Lord. Man, that's exciting. That, that is enough to make a Baptist want to shout just a little bit. To know about his great love that lifts us up. That's something that we can, we can face the next day because we know that Jesus, what we talk about Sunday, that Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Well, that's great to know. And, and it's just a wonder that we, <laughs> that God, he, that he's so patient with us. That he, uh, that he puts up with us. And I'm glad that he does. Amen. At this time, we like to go to a time of prayer. We do want to remember uh, the request for prayer. I remember Mr. Robert. I haven't heard today from his catheterization, but I do keep him lifted up and uh, in prayer. Uh, might there be others outspoken requests right quick? Any, um, the gentleman Ho Hoisted, Randy Houston. Re remember Randy Houston. Um, any others? Jill Taylor. Yes, remember Jill Taylor. Yes, Ms. Reed. Okay. Any others? Ms. Rose. Okay. Okay. Yes, Ms. Rose. Okay. And uh, any others? I'm going to ask uh, uh, Brother David. Peck, if he would come and lead us in this time of prayer, and as he's coming this way, remember the service tonight. Brother Mike, as he comes to preach for us in just a few moments, uh, Potter's Clay, as they come and sing, we're looking forward for God to move in people's lives and, and it, 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 the life of the church. Uh, we, we need revival. We need renewing, and that's what we're here for. And So let's join together in, in a time of prayer, and as we are led in this time together, um, pray your heart that which you may be holding in your heart that uh, you may not think that you can carry it alone, but God can help you if you just give it to him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us all here together today, Lord. I pray that uh, um, I know you're working something in each and every one of our lives. Lord, tonight I, I pray for the speaker that you would uh, speak through him to each and every one of us. Lord, open our hearts and our minds what you have to say to us and let us all learn something. And, and, and more importantly, Lord, let us learn something that we can share to others that they, we can uh, further, uh, further your gospel, Lord, and, and further um, we, um, the good news of you, Lord, to others. Uh, Lord, uh, thank you for just all the blessings that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you would, uh, as this week, on, this week continues, Lord, that you would continue to bless us and um, in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to stand in the way much tonight. We're going to move on with what God has in store. Uh, we're looking forward to having uh, the Lord represented in song and in word. And just as we did last night, we're going to uh, let the singers come sing. And uh, then after they get done, Brother Mike, you can share the you can share the word. We're pleased to have Potter's Clay, their short one member. They were told earlier, their banjo picker. So if you can play the banjo, you might want to come help them. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> they're come to. I've heard the sound check, <clears throat> and and they've been here to. <clears throat> excuse me, one of the senior fellowship, and so I'm, you're probably aware of what they do, but we're looking forward to hearing from them as the Lord has laid upon their heart. They said they had enough music to last till midnight. <clears throat> so if you respond real well, you may be here till midnight. But, uh, but Brother Mike said he's going to preach anyway. So, right. so <laughs> we're just looking forward to what God's going to do. And after they get done, Brother Mike Ledbetter will once again come share with us what God has laid upon his heart as he shares from the Word of God tonight. God Amen. bless you guys as you come and share. Amen.
Yep, they're all my kids. <laughs> <laughs> they got so all the looks and looks. Well, the brother in Christ. I'm there you go.
<laughs> Amen. <laughs> Brother Greg, I'm just so sorry my wife cannot be here tonight. She'd be hugging on you and kissing on you once again. Let me tell you, you can't see her, but she's just as pretty as could be. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. It's so good to see you. I feel like uh, I feel like I got a half a membership at your church, and uh, you know I just resigned my church about six weeks ago, and the storm came, and I throw I thought maybe it'd blow pat away, and you all call me there, but he didn't understand he's still there. So, anyways, God bless you all. Tell Brother Pat we love him very much, and. And uh, we really appreciate you all being here uh, with us tonight. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Ezekiel chapter 37 tonight. Ezekiel chapter 37. I feel like at my age, I have just joined the WWW. White hair, wide waist, and thankful I'm a little bit wiser. <laughs> I'm going to read a lengthy passage tonight. Do you know when... The Word of God was given to us in the English language by the King James. Uh, and if you've got one of the original King James Bibles, if you open up to the front of the Bible, it does say this, to be read aloud in the church. And uh, I know, Greg, you don't have your Bible with you. Shame on you. So you're going to have to listen tonight. Will you stand with me, please? Let's honor this word in Ezekiel chapter 37. I want to preach a message tonight entitled, Good Vibrations. Verse 30, uh, beginning at verse uh, 1 of chapter 37, we're going to read down to verse 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again, he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I'll put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied, and there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered over them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, O Son of Man, and say to the breath, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came to them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. He said to me, Son of Man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will, sh I will open your graves, and cause you to come up from your graves, and bring you into the land of Israel, and you will know that I am the Lord. And when I have opened up your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. And these you, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, performed it, says the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. It was a privilege to be home on uh, September 9th to preach my uh, homecoming of my home church. Uh, there was, um, uh, it's the 62nd year uh, of that church. I was uh, saved when I was nine years old, so that church was very, very young when I uh, went to that church for the very first time. It was such a privilege to be able to go home and to preach. 
of a youth group, there's probably only about a half a dozen of them left still in the church that are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We had a great uh, youth group. We had about 20 or 25. And of all the association around the area, we had probably over 200 young people that would come together once a month. And we would, uh, of course, have our youth rallies and serve the Lord. And we love music. Folks, I love music. I have no musical talent whatsoever. I like all kinds of music. In fact, my favorite music of all time is from Tchaikovsky, the 1812 Overture. I think it's the finest piece of music that has ever been written. All 15 minutes of it, I just love that piece of music. I love blue, bluegrass. I love all kinds of music. But, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have these CDs. We didn't have, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the DVDs. We didn't have uh, uh, these iPods and all these things. What we had on our cars that mom and daddy owned was an AM radio. That's all it was. And uh, when something came on that you would really like, you know, that's when you really lit- listen to it. Because they didn't, you didn't call in and say, can you play this? And where my daddy used to have a gas station, they finally closed it down, and they built a Burger King. Boy, we thought we were something, you know, that we were actually going to be able to go get a hamburger, and we were going to sit in the car, and we were going to listen to music. And I'll never forget a good friend of mine, Dave Osterkamp. In fact, he was at the uh, homecoming while, while I was there, and we were playing the music, and a piece of music came on that we had never heard before. And it was a group that we really loved. It was called the Beach Boys. Now, some of you younger, you might not know that, but I love the Beach Boys. I think they have a, a great harmony. And this was a song that was just different than they've ever sung before in their life. It was called Good Vibrations. And we were young and we were living. Listen, it was Good Vibrations back then. I want you to understand something tonight. God wants us to have Good Vibrations once again. And I, of course, I love to read about D.L. Moody, and it was October 8th in 1871. And folks, I figured out that's 141 years ago. Anybody remember that? Thank you so very much. D.L. Moody was preaching on a Sunday night to the largest crowd that he's ever had in his church, and he preached a famous message. In fact, you can go online and you can find this message today. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And he used Matthew chapter 27, verse 22. And at the end of the sermon, he said this. I want you to take this text home with you. I want you to turn it over in your minds. And during the week and the next Sabbath, the next Sunday, I want you to come to Calvary. I want you to come to the cross. And we're going to decide what we're going to do with this Jesus called Nazareth. Of course, Ira Sankey, one of the great uh, song leaders and songwriters, you look in your songbooks and you'll see the name Ira Sankey there. And he stood up and he began to lead the congregation in a special hymn. It was, the, the hymn was this, Today the Savior calls for refuge fly. The storms of justice falls and death is nigh. And before he could finish that singing, before that song was over with in that great church, that auditorium, the sounds of um, uh, fire engines were going by. They were rushing by. And uh, before morning, the city of Chicago lay in ashes. I think he never had a chance to finish that hymn that day. And how many lost their lives that night that were in that church when D.O. Moody said, I want you to wait one week. And then I want you to come back and decide what you're going to do with Jesus. Folks, there's a sense of urgency about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. D.L. Moody's own writings, he says, to his dying day, he regretted standing before that great congregation and telling them to wait one week before they decided to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he said, I have never since dared to give an audience a week to think about their salvation. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I've never seen that congregation since. 
I will never meet those people until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you one of the lessons that I've learned that night, which I have never forgotten, that is, when I preach, I press Christ upon the people then and there and trying to bring them to a decision right there on the spot. He said, I would rather have my right hand cut off than to give an audience a week to decide what to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a day and time, folks, where a church now is full of indifference. We think that everything's going to last until tomorrow. One day, there is not going to be another day. One day, you're going to realize that we're no longer going to be here. One of my best friends in ministry, one of my best friends that I play golf with, I played golf with him just a couple of months ago, and in just a three weeks after we played golf, we put him in the ground. He's now with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know the next time that we're going to see one another. We have friends, we have families that are dying, and they need to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of life. And tonight, I want to preach to you with urgency and with fervency once again. Tonight's the night to make a decision of what you're going to do with this one called the Christ. Now, I realize that many of you know Jesus as Savior, Lord of, of, of your life. And, but you need to make a decision what you're going to do with this Jesus and how you're going to reach the world for him. So when we look at this particular passage of Scripture, Ezekiel is 25 years old, and he's a priest from the family of Zadok. And uh, he, along with the king and 10,000 other Jews, were taken into Babylon in uh, 598 B.C. Five years later, in 593 B.C., Ezekiel was 30 years old, and God placed a calling upon his life. Folks, we need to pray for callings once again. I resigned my church just six weeks ago, and I've accepted another church just two weeks ago. But in the last two weeks, I've had nine churches contacting me and saying they need somebody to come and be their pastor. I cannot be everywhere at one time. And some of them, of course, there was a desire at one time to go there, but God has called us into a particular place. But I'm praying that God is going to raise up nine extra men that are going to fill the pulpit and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ezekiel's name means strengthened by God. And if you look at this book, it is just filled full, full of visions. There are 20 plus years of faithful ministry and how he followed the Lord. And one of these visions tonight is the Valley of Dry Bones. And I've heard it preached for revi revival. And uh, I know it's, it's a valid passage for that. But folks, God's not speaking to the church once again. He's speaking to the nation of Israel. He sees them as a dead nation. He promised this dead nation that one day that he will raise them from the dead and use them for the glory of the Lord. Let's not be jealous of what God's going to do for Israel one day because we're going to be in the background. We're going to be right there. And it's because of Israel and because of Jesus we are blessed today. When Ezekiel received this vision, he found himself surrounded by a bunch of dead bones. And everywhere he looked, he saw dead people. And he was commanded to, to them to preach over them. And he was commanded over them to pray over them. And when he obeyed the Lord's command, Ezekiel saw these dead bones began to shake and began to rattle. And good vibrations began to happen once again. And he saw the Lord's display bringing the dead back to life again. But like Ezekiel, we're surrounded by the dead people. And you know, Ezekiel must have thought, this is a very impossible task. We can't do this. But he obeyed God, and God blessed his efforts. The first thing we find tonight is this revelation. If we're going to have a sense of a great need in this world, they need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have a clear condition of the world around us. Ezekiel saw a valley full of dry bones, scattered bones. It, those bones represented desolation and destitution and devastated upon uh, Israel. And we have a, a similar vision in our world today. It's the same vision we need to look at. There's a dead, lost world out there that needs Jesus. He saw death. 
One thing that broke his heart was to know that this was part of his heritage. This was part of his family. One of the worst insults a Jew could suffer was not to have a a, a proper burial of those that are dead. And here's a valley filled full of bones that are dead. They've been defeated by their enemies. They've been left to rot where they fell. And Ezekiel saw this vision in a very massive scale. We see people today, and I hope you look at them in a different way after this week. We see them working on their jobs, and they're enjoying their hobbies, and they're raising their families, and, you know, they may be charming, and they're intellectual, reasonable, and apparently fit. But, folks, if they don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of life, they're spiritually dead. The Bible says that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And, you know, it's, it's, it can be true of, of husbands and wives and, and children and parents and neighbors and co-workers. They may be full of life physically, but spiritually they're absolutely dead. Jesus said, Say ye not, are there yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look in the fields, for they're white already for harvest. I've been watching them uh, bring the cotton in. And it reminds me of that verse of Scripture. Listen, our world is like that it's ripe all we have to do is go out and get them for the lord jesus christ the condition of the lost around us the bible tells us in romans chapter 3 they're all gone other way and they become unprofitable unprofitable means this to be absolutely useless there are people who are lost in the quagmire of sin and they cannot escape There are people that are locked up in in alcoholism. There are people that are wrapped up with drugs in their life. There are people that are wrapped up in sexual sins. But they need need somebody to tell them there is a better way. I'll never forget early in ministry that I witnessed to a young man. And and, uh, he came to church, but he he was just a hopeless alcoholic. You know, he just just loved to drink. He, He loved to drink his beer. And I'll never forget one night they, they called me and said, so-and-so, uh, he, he's trying to commit suicide. Preacher, will you please come? And I'll never forget going over there, and there was a mama over there at the table praying, had the Bible open, a wife was over there praying, and here's this man, and he said, you know what, I just want to run through that plate glass window. And I, I, I just want to, I just wanted, he, he was so drunk at that time, I stayed with him all night long. In the three years of ministry, I witnessed to him as faithfully as I could. And I left that church knowing that he didn't give his heart to the Lord. But I kept praying for him. And I was at an association meeting one day. And, you know, we get together at association meetings. And, and we get to see people again. And the doors opened up. And here walked a man in in a three-piece suit. And we looked at me. And he looked at one another. You know, and he come up and he put his arms around me. And he was that old drunk. And guess what? He had given his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and God called him into ministry. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, there are people out there that need Jesus Christ. He's, you see, Ezekiel saw devastation. He saw that they were very dry. The heat had been so merciless on, on them. They were sapped of all mo- moisture in them. Dry, they were fit for nothing. They were absolutely useless. And this is the very condition of the lost. The drunkard is lost. The good man, he, he's lost. They are useless in the sight, the sight of God. And we need to make sure that we tell them there's a better way. He saw defeat. He said this, our bones are dried and and our hope is lost. There are many people out there tonight that think nobody cares for them whatsoever. You know what people want? They want to be loved. They want to be cared for. So many children. Brother Tim, I've been going to youth camp for 32 years now. They're about to wear me out. I've seen young men called to preach. I've seen young people give their heart to the Lord that I did their baby dedication when years ago. And, and now many of them are serve, serving the Lord. And, and what a blessing it is to see them living for the Lord Jesus Christ. But I've seen also young people where they have gone off and they've gone way in the other way. The drugs and the alcohol and the illicit sex have just taken over their lives. And there are people tonight that think there's no hope whatsoever. 
There are people in despair, and we need to reach out and help them once again. We need to show them that there is, is hope. There's hopelessness in this world. We see the restlessness of our nation, the upheaval of our culture. You know, I'm all right, and I'm going to be all right. I worry about my grandchildren. I worry about the world that they're going to live in unless the Lord comes back, you see. Uh, you know, the horrible condition of our, really our economy because we are so in debt at this time. Who is going to pay for this? The constant threat of war. I live in the time of, of the Vietnam War. Never got called to that because I was in, in, in school. But there are people today that see all these things and says it's absolutely hopeless. And these people that do not know Jesus Christ, you have, must understand something. They're not for us. They are against us. They're not for God. They're against God. They don't like the church. They don't like God. They don't love him whatsoever. And we need a burden once again that these dead, devastated, defeated in their sins, that they will give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll lay that right there. Last night I showed you my marble, my RPM, and I think probably Sharon Baptist remembers that I carry a marble with me, a reminder prayer marble. That's a precious one. We'll talk about it in just a second. In the 1700s, there was a, a man in England, a cobbler by trade, and he had a map of the world over his bench, and he prayed. He prayed for a missionary out, outreach. He became so burdened with this missionary out, outreach that he went before some ministers and then he was told by one of the senior men of God, young men, you need to sit down. When God wants to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. He saw no vision, but that young man was named by the name of William Carey. His enthusiasm was not dampened by such a response. And he left the shores of England for India, and there he worked for the Lord Jesus Christ. This marble, I put it in a very special place because this is a very special marble because I had it on me during the month of July. It was two years ago that I had an opportunity to be part of a mission work. It's called Haiti Gospel Mission. It is uh, an independent group, but largely supported by the Free Will Baptists, original Free Will Baptists, and also the National Association of Free Will Baptists. And uh, I went to Haiti, uh, Port-au-Prince, Port and went down to Despinos. We have a church there that runs about 275 people. We have a children's church. They have about 50 in the church, a beautiful little church. We have a clinic there. And... Uh, we have the compound there. I had a chance to preach, and if you've never preached uh, uh, to a foreign group of people and using an interpreter, that's different. And uh, you have to learn right away. There's some things that they don't know anything about. It's hard to use illustrations. A, preacher, a friend of mine was preaching to them, and he was trying to tell a story about a squirrel, and they don't know what a squirrel was, you know? So, uh, you know, it kind of messed them up. But while I was down there, uh, I had an opportunity. I, my wife didn't know this, but uh, my goal was to win somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ. We went down a, a dusty road, and I witnessed some, some girls. They were braiding their hair. I asked them to braid mine. They said, no, man, we're not going to braid your hair. They need Jesus as Savior of their life. Got all the way down the end to what I call a 7-Eleven. The 7-Eleven, think of your, your shack, and they sold drinks out of it and things that you could, you know, cook with, some coal and stuff like that. Very, uh, well, it, it, it's very backwoods. And a little girl says, I want you to pray for me that I'll pass my high school exam. You don't pass high school till you're about 22 years old, and you have to pay money uh, to pass this exam. Uh, Rosie in the compound, uh, she lacked $2 paying for her exam, and they would not let her take her exam and had to wait six months for that. Anyways, this little girl, I said, well, you know, you can pray yourself. She says, I don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. I said, really? I said, what? <laughs> I said, what? You don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord of life? And through the interpreter, we won that little girl, Lord. Her name was J Day Georgia Lynn. 
And it was just a thrill. I called my wife, and I had choked up with tears. And I said, look, I, I want somebody to Jesus while I was down there in, in Haiti. We went way up in the, up in the hills, and, and that's where they grow the mangoes and where they grow sugar cane. And, folks, it's just about as back as far you get you know, away from civilization. And there's a fellow with an old makeshift wheelbarrow, and, and we want him to the Lord. Well, our main thing was to go down to witness, but also to work. And the widow woman, we need, we need to build a roof for the old house down there. And very simple. It's just old block and blo cinder block uh, floors and all. And, and uh, the only time you have water is when you put a cistern up here and it, it collects. And you can, you can, you know, have running water in your house. But when you, when you go down to Haiti, you do work. The Haitians come out and they love to watch you work. I mean, they just sat there all day long. You know, it doesn't matter. And there was this tall Haitian. He was about like this, and he liked my hat. I had one of those safari hats. Somebody had given it to me, and uh, he got the interpreter, and he says, get that white man. And uh, what he wanted, he wanted my hat. And look, listen, I, I left all my clothes, left all my shoes, left, you know, the only thing I brought home was my underwear. You know, I figured they didn't want that. But, you know, you, they, because they appreciate every, everything you can give them. Yeah, they've probably, they probably taken that too, to be honest with you. Anyways, uh, uh, he wanted my hat, and so I gave it to him. He came back the next day, he was wearing that hat. And I left and came home. Glory in that day, Georgia Lynn won her heart, Lord. And then the other man gave his heart, Lord. And, and little did I know, little did we know, that this gentleman was a voodoo witch doctor. Folks, he is the priest in the area. They will even sacrifice children. You can go on the compound at night and you can hear the screams and the hollering. And so we began to pray for this man. His name is Luke. L-U-C. He started coming to church. And Pastor Ellison, he would witness to him there. And he even gave food to the church, which was beans and rice, which is very valuable back then, you know. And, and uh, then this past year, my missionary friend and the gentleman that got me involved with Haiti Gospel Mission was invited over to Luke's house. And they went into his home, which is unheard of, called the Parasil. That's where they do the voodoo rituals. That's where they do the sacrifices. And God has been working on Luke. Along the back wall, there were all kind of murals of de demon worship and, and, and things like that. He had sanded all of that off the walls. Where he used to give the sacrifices, he was renting those rooms out. And Joel Hess, the missionary, and Tom Beam, who is one of the helpers there, they began to pray with Luke. Luke, don't you want to give your heart to Jesus? Luke, don't you think it's time to give your heart to the Lord? Your son's gotten saved. You've been coming to church. Don't you want to give your heart to the Lord? And this is what Luke said. This ran through me. It hit me through my feet and ran me up to the, the top of my, my head. He said, I'm waiting for that white man from America. He was waiting for me. A preacher from North Carolina. He wanted me to come. He wanted me to come and pray with him. And I planned to go to Haiti. And if you knew anything, the riots. The riots happened. And we had to cancel all of our plans. And we, there were some things we wanted to do. And uh, there was a window that opened up. And so we were able to go on a Saturday and fly in. We left at 5 o'clock in the morning. We didn't get there till 9 o'clock that night. We worshiped that Sunday. Luke wasn't at church that Sunday, but Monday morning we went to his home. He wasn't there. But when we began to pray, God, our mission is to go talk to Luke. But on Tuesday, we went back over there. Luke came out of his peristyle, and he saw me, and I saw him. And he came, and that Haitian put his arms around me. And we just embraced for the longest time in that old dusty road. And he told the interpreter, 
Come on in. Come on in. There's chickens running everywhere. There's children running everywhere. I saw where he had sanded off all of those scenes that are on the back wall. I saw the kitchen, and you'd be just appalled at what the, what the kitchen is. It's just a little old pot over a, an open pit right there. And I began to talk to Luke. I said, Luke, I hear that you've been waiting on me. I said, i am come to tell you about Jesus. Jesus loves you. And listen, the tears are falling down my face. I was so excited, and I was just, I was about to explode. And they began to give excuses. I can wait till my next life because Buddhism believes that you can be reincarnated. And for 45 minutes through the interpreter, we witnessed to Luke. And all of a sudden, he took his sandals off and fell to his knees. And he gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Listen, folks. I gloried in that day. I shouted all over Haiti. You probably heard it in Washington, D.C. Because Luke gave his heart to Jesus. And folks, he was waiting on a white man from America. And I was able to go tell him about Jesus Christ. And this was the marble I had in my pocket. This was my Haiti marble. This was my Luke marble. And I keep it in a precious box. Is because of that prayer and because of that, that burden, Luke gave his heart to Jesus Christ. I want you to be excited once again about somebody giving their heart to Jesus. I got excited the day my daddy gave his heart to the Lord. I got excited about the day my mama gave her heart to the Lord. I got excited about the day my sister gave her heart to the Lord. I got excited about the day my son gave his heart to Jesus. I got excited when my daughter gave his heart to Jesus. I got excited when my first grandchild called me and says, Granddaddy, I've given my heart to Jesus. Folks, there's people out there that need Jesus. They're not just in Haiti. They're right out there. Ezekiel looked at it. Ezekiel, God told him what to do. And this is what he said. I want you to go over there those dry bones and I want you to preach. Tim? <laughs> he told him to preach to a bunch of bones. About like me to preach on Sunday sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. You know? I know how it is. You fold your arms and say, move me if you can. I know I can't move you, but God can. Prophesy to these bones, say to them, you're dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. He was commanded to preach to the valley of skeletons. And nothing could be more foolish, more ridiculous to preaching through a bunch of dry bones. And then God asked him a question. Ezekiel, do you think these bones can live again? I hope God has this to replay. <laughs> Can't you imagine Ezekiel? Here he is. He's already been told to preach to these bunch of bones. He's already preached a sermon to these old bones. Didn't get any response whatsoever. Didn't get an amen. Didn't get an old me. Didn't even get a shaking during that time. And God said, do you think these bones can live again? And Ezekiel scratching his head just a little bit. But he comes up with the right answer and says this. Oh, Lord, you know they can. You see what we need to realize today? Yes, God can. I can't. God can do it again. What's more difficult than to confront a world that's lifeless and useless and hopeless men that need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the clear ob obligation of the church. And he was blessed through preaching. I love preaching. I love listening to preaching. I love doing their preaching. And guess what happened? Only through preaching, through the verse 7, good vibrations began to happen. A noise happened. A shaking happened. And the bones began to come together, bone to bone. The Bible says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It knows all about me. You see, the church, people out there, they don't need to hear about our church. They don't need to hear about our denomination. He doesn't need to hear about our preachers and about our opinions. They need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was commanded to pray. Oh, you just don't know, folks. The burden that was on me when I knew that Luke was waiting for a white man from America 
And that Sunday, uh, when I was in the choir, and we were singing, People Need the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm supposed to be in Haiti today. And because of riots, I can't be there. Would you give life and breath to Luke? So one day when I can get there, I can tell him about Jesus. He was commanded to pray. Breathe upon these slain that they may live. Folks, preaching. Sometimes we need to hear the noise. We need the noise of a rushing mighty wind once again. We need the noise of an amen every once in a while. And folks, there needs to be a time, even during preaching, that you can come to an altar. It doesn't have to be just at an altar call. If God calls you to come to an altar during a service, you go ahead and do it. Obey God. They had the appearance. Listen, the sinew had come on their bodies and, and the flesh had come on their bodies, but there was no breath and they had the appearance of life, but they were still dead. They remained absolutely dead until the Spirit of God came upon them. You see, at Pentecost, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind and they became alive once again. We need to preach once again with divine urgency. Today's the day of salvation. Today's for the church to get alive and we need to pray also with divine urgency, uh, fervency once again. And let us pray for the gospel. Let's pray for the preachers. Let's pray for the teachers, the churches, the missionaries, the witness. Let us pray with fervency and let's tell them with urgency that they need Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of their life. Finally, this tonight, the response of the preaching and praying, verse 10 says, they lived. They lived. These corpses, <laughs> they were animated, they were revitalized, and I believe the old prophet stood there with his mouth so open saying, God, wow, wow. They stood, they stood on their feet. We need to teach people to take a stand once again for Jesus Christ. I have to tell me, I have people tell me all the time, oh, I don't go to church, I look at them and say, well, I do. You know, tell them you go to church. You know, well, some of them, you know, they like this certain church. And I said, well, I'll tell you about church. We're just a traditional church. We love Jesus. But find a church you want to go to and worship him. We need to tell people to stand once again for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the redeemed once again stand up and say something for the Lord. I want you to realize this. There are no unwanted people in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody is welcome to the church. And we need to make sure that we're bringing them in. And when we come together and realize it's not us, it's not the church, but it's the power of God, it says when they came together, they became a great, mighty, massive army. You remember singing about, you know, uh, in, in Bible school and marching to Zion, marching to Zion. I could feel it deep down in my soul. Listen, the work of the Holy Spirit will bring individual units, individual people with their talents to come as a whole and be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God brings people out of their deadness that they might live for him. How were they assured? God said this, I'm going to put my spirit within you. I'm going to put my spirit. Boy, don't you love the Holy Spirit? Don't you love the Holy Spirit? I don't know about you, but when the Holy Spirit hits me, he hits me in my chin. He hits me right there, you know. And uh, when God was calling me into ministry at the age of 16 years old, I did everything I could to keep from going to the altar that night at, at, at youth camp. But God began to punch me, and he punched me right in my chin. A 16-year-old ain't supposed to cry. But I knew what God was calling me to do. And I'll never forget going to that altar that night. And I'll never forget the counselor's name was Keith Kenimer. And I told that man right there, that counselor, God is calling me into ministry. And after that, I thought, what in the world have I done? What in the world have I just said? What in the world am I going to do? You know, they said, just be prepared. Be prepared. Listen. God's blessing on the church is not over. I know the Bible says there's going to be a great falling away, but bless God, we don't have to do it. 
We can be the ones preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's still the same today as he always been. He's still working in a supernatural way. He's sovereign in what he accomplishes in this world. And folks, I'm going to tell you what. I look at this world sometimes and I get so angry. You know, many of you from Sharon Baptist know my wife. She's a, she's a beautiful lady. She's not just a woman. She's a lady. She's a Christian lady. We don't go out to eat that much, uh, but when we do, I like to take her something nice like McDonald's. <laughs> you can buy two hamburgers, fries, and a drink, and you share that for $5. <laughs> no, every once in a while, we try to do something a little bit nicer, and we go someplace, and, and I hear language. It makes me so angry. And I want to go up to him and say, don't you know that you're using that language in the presence of a lady? But then again, I hear these girls saying the same thing. And I get angry. I get mad. I shouldn't be. You know why? They don't know any better. Nobody's told them. They're lost. They need Jesus. They need a transformation. So instead of me getting mad, I need to be getting glad and praying that God can speak to them and maybe use me to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can these bones live again? Can the church live again? Yes, they can. The mission seems absolutely impossible before us. But let me tell you, God is not a God of impossibilities, but a God of possibilities. They only need a witness to tell them about Jesus Christ, to be a prayer warrior for them, and that God would draw them so close. And I'm going to tell you what, there's a reason for shouting when somebody gives their heart to the Lord when you work so hard to tell them about Jesus. You know somebody tonight that needs the Lord, don't you? I prayed 16 long years for my father to give his heart to the Lord. I thought there would never be a day that I know that my daddy had gotten saved. He was a good man, didn't go to church. It wasn't until after I went into ministry that I got a phone call on a Tuesday afternoon. And dad never called. I thought something was the matter with mama. Dad, what's the matter? What's the matter with mom? But my dad told me the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, son, I've given my heart to Jesus. Amen. Folks, I shouted all over that parsonage. I didn't probably shout in the bathroom, but I did every other room. I shouted all over there because my dad had given his heart to Jesus. My dad gave public profession the next Sunday. He was saved on Tuesday. Made public profession on Sunday. I'll be finished in a minute, okay? All right? And, uh, and then he was baptized the next Sunday and joined the church the next Sunday. My dad, since 1977, has been the most faithful man in the church. He's the first one there and the last one to leave. He's deacon in the church. He's treasurer of the school. And when God saved my daddy... God did a good job. There's some daddies out there that need Jesus. This altar is going to be open here in just a moment. Don't you think it's time to pray for them? See, the only reason I think that I was able to get down to Haiti is that God make a way. And what a glorious time it was. All the rest of the time we were there, we kept saying, Luke got saved. Luke got saved. <laughs> We wake up in the morning, Luke got saved. In the evening, we say, Luke got saved. Let me tell you something, Luke got saved. <laughs> May we have the lights out, please. May I do a drawing for you tonight. This is 1,186 tonight. 48 years we have been doing these. We pray you'll be blessed once again. The altar call in just a moment if God is speaking to your heart. And there's somebody that you know that needs Jesus. Don't you want to pray for them? And maybe tonight you do not know Jesus as Savior, Lord, of your life. I, I don't know. Yes, you know. Only you know. But God's speaking to your heart. Don't you want to know him? Don't die and go to hell. Don't wait tomorrow. Don't wait another week. Know Jesus tonight.
the music that I played tonight is very, very special to me. Because one of the girls that sang on that was one of my young people in the youth group. And about 14 years ago, on a Mother Day weekend, to her and her best friend were going down the road to Spivey's Corner and an accident took place. Carla, one of the sweetest Christian girls I ever met in my life, went on to be with the Lord. It was a tragedy, such a bright future for her. I knew her husband, when they were dating, they would attend the church. She was just a bright and shining star, but that accident took place. Since then, I've been able to play this music every time that I've done a revival meeting. I tell her mama all the time I use this music of Third Promise. It speaks to so much to me because she was part of my youth group. Jesus Christ died on the cross for Carla that she might know him as Savior and Lord of her life. And that day that Carly gave her heart to the Lord, and even in the tragedy that took place on that day, that car accident when she went on to be with the Lord, the Lord loved her, the Lord cared for her. And in that moment, she sang her last song. She took her last breath. But because of Calvary, because of what she believed in, God took her home. There's going to be a time when there's going to be a tragedy. And unless you've won your family members to the Lord, they're going to die and go to hell. They're not, not everybody goes to heaven, folks, unless they know Jesus is saving the Lord of the life. Is there somebody that needs Jesus that only you can win to the Lord? They're dried up. They're dead bones. And God's telling you to preach to them and pray with them. There needs to be a sense of urgency and a sense of fervency once again. And then the old song says, we will be coming again, bringing the sheaves with us, rejoicing once again. It's time for some rejoicing in the church. It's time for a shaking in the church. There's some times for some good vibrations. Oh, God, shake the church. Shake individuals and bring us to our knees that we might win people to Jesus. Will you stand with me and bow your heads, please? Get ready for invitation. Our light's on. Brother Pastor, come. Lead to the invitation as you see fit. We preach God's uh, imparted the word through us. And God, we pray that you people respond as you see fit. Save those nearest to, nearest to hell, dear God, that they might live for Jesus. But may we have fervency and urgency once again for the Lord Jesus Christ.
Yes. Yes, he does. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful message to share? When was the last time that you told somebody that Jesus loves them? We're going to sing that as the invitation. Amen. Tonight. Amen. And, and most of us know that first verse, but but it, it, as you prepare, and I think it's on page 344 if you want to, to get the hymn book out, that's fine. I think it's 344. If you thought you could get it, it is. Uh, the last verse of that song, this is one that was added uh, after the Bartlett's wrote this on the waters. It says, Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me all the way. If I love him when I die, he will take me home. Amen. Jesus loves us so very much. Yes. That he died on the cross. Let's sing that with him, please. something that will smolder and be kindled within our hearts for a long time to come. That it might be one of those bookmark events that we can look back years from now and say it's that moment that God changed the spiritual direction of our church and his will. Yes. Can it be that? Go on. God knows. Just like those dead dry bones. Yeah. God knows. Amen. Yes. So Mike, you would make your way to the door and give the folks an opportunity love with you and thank you again for coming and thank you for sharing your time again invite someone to come and be a part of the service tomorrow. May God's grace be made to shine upon us. May his love ever abide in our hearts. May he guide each step that we take and bring us back together to celebrate the wonderful joy of Christian fellowship and the hearing of God's word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Liberty to go in the fear of God. Shake somebody.